All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this event entitled High Stakes on the Indo-Chinese Border Implications for the Region, the United States, and the World. My name is David Fields, and I am the Associate Director of the Center for East Asian Studies at the University of Wisconsin. Today's event is co-sponsored by the Center for East Asian Studies and also the Center for South Asian Studies at the University of Wisconsin. And if you found your way to this event, it is likely that our centers offer many other events and programming that you might find interesting as well. So please visit us at eastasia.wisc.edu and at southasia.wisc.edu for details about future programming and more information on the activities of our center. Today, we are honored to have as a moderator for this event, Professor Judd Kinsley. Professor Kinsley is a historian of modern China at the University of Wisconsin who specializes in the history of the Chinese border regions. He is the author of numerous articles and essays, as well as the recent book, Natural Resources and the New Frontier, Constructing Modern China's Borderlands, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2018. We are delighted to have Professor Kinsley and three outstanding panelists as our guide on this very timely and important issue. Thank you very much for joining us, Professor Kinsley. Thanks, David, and thanks to the Center for South Asia and the Center for um, uh, Center for East Asian Studies. Um, I'm really happy to be moderating. As David said, I'm a historian of um, Chinese history, and so uh, you know I'm not a South Asia specialist by any means. So I'm excited to learn more, and I, I have done a lot of work with Western Chinese border regions, not really the border with China. So I'm not entirely an expert, but um, I'm happy to be here and to, to learn from our esteemed guests. I think the general plan is that the, uh, our guests will speak for 15 to 20 minutes or so, um, and then we'll open things up for question and answer. And if you have a question for the panelists, um, if you could put it in the chat, then we will relay that to our, our esteemed guests. Um, but before we open things up, I just want to offer an introduction um, to the guests and uh, again, to, to thank them for Taking their time out of their their busy schedules, um, we have uh, starting here on the on the left is uh, Arunab Ghosh, uh, who's a historian of modern China, um, and his research and teaching interests are in social and economic history, history of science and statecraft, um, transnational history, and China India India history, and he's a historian at, at Harvard. Um, and his first book, um, Making It Count. Statistics and Statecraft in the Early People's Republic was published by Princeton uh, this year in 2020. So, so congratulations uh, on, on that. And he's working on a series of other projects, um, which are some of which are connected to China and India, or at least there's an India component as, as his first book has, um, a history of dam and reservoir construction in 20th century China and a history of China, India, networks of science, 1920s, uh, 1920 to 1980. Our second uh, esteemed guest, uh, Manjari Chatterjee Miller, um, is an associate professor of international, uh, international relations at the Frederick S. Uh, Party School of Global Studies at Boston University. Um, and she is also a research associate at the Oxford School of Global uh, and Area Studies. Um, her book, uh, Wronged by Empire, Post-Imperial Ideology and Foreign Policy in India and China, was published by Stanford University Press. Um, and she also is the author of two other books, including Why Nations Rise, um, Narratives, and Pat, uh, Narratives and the Path to Great Power by Oxford, forthcoming, um, and a book which is definitely related to the subject matter today, The Handbook on China-India Relations, um, forthcoming, or it's already out by, by Rutledge? Uh, it came out earlier this year. Earlier this year. Okay, great. Um, and finally, last but not least, um, we have Pro Professor T.V. Paul, who is a uh, who's the James McGill Professor of International Relations at the Department of Political, in the Department of Political Science um, at McGill University. Um, and he focuses on international security, uh, regional security, and, and South Asia. And he's the author of uh, 20 books, including several recent books that are definitely related to the subject matter today, including a 2019 edited volume, um, India and China Maritime Competition, uh, and another recent book, also very closely related to the subject matter today, China-India Rivalry in the Global Era, which came out in 2018. Um, so uh, please join me in, in welcoming these three esteemed guests. I think we'll start probably with uh, Arudnab and make our way across uh, across the, 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 three, the three panelists. So, so thanks, thanks so much for, for being here and, and enlightening us. 
Great. Uh, thank you so much, Judd, for the, the warm introduction. And thank you also to uh, uh, Professor Fields and Professor Dr. Beckham uh, for the invitation to be here. Uh, and it's, uh, as we were remarking before we began, I, I get to meet Professor Paul and, and Professor Chatterjee Miller. So it's, 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 uh, there are multiple sort of bonuses for me here. Um, <clears throat> what I thought, thought I'd do with my time is uh, sort of uh, provide a sense of uh, how I think about China and India uh, together in terms of their histories and in terms of sort of the frameworks through which we understand them uh, uh, and not really focus so much on the uh, on, on the sort of the recent con conflagration a few months ago uh, uh, but but sort of maybe give us some sort of sort of uh, uh, framework to think about uh, China and India in the, in the 21st century now so I'm thinking of doing uh, about uh, trying to go over five points and the first I'll talk a little bit about what I see as the dominant frameworks for understanding China and India uh, and there are primarily two, I think, that 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 uh, that we operate between. One is the civilizational, and the other is the real politique framework. And I'll, I'll describe them a little bit. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about what I see the roots of this framework are, and the ways in which uh, a particular uh, way of approaching uh, China and India, especially in the Western Academy, informs, I think, these these frameworks, uh, which then comes with certain certain baggages. Uh, uh, the, then what I want to do is. Uh, mention briefly um, uh, what I see, sort of maybe move to the contemporary moment and talk a little bit about what I see as rather interesting asymmetries and symmetries in China and India today. If we were to juxtapose them, then what kinds of symmetries are, are, are immediately evident and what kinds of asymmetries? And I think these are, again, very important to keep in mind in light of now uh, increased border tensions. Um, I'll then briefly highlight, and I'm happy to go into this in Q&A if people are interested, uh, what remains to me a, a surprising feature of the China-India relationship, which is that there is a mutual, a high degree of mutual ignorance, sometimes uh, uh, also a, a prideful mutual ignorance about, about each other, which I think contributes in some ways to some of the problems. Uh, and then finally, I'll mention uh, uh, one, so I'll bring the US in because we are, we are at election time, and I'll, I'll make a brief point about how I think the US is, is potentially an interesting site for some of these uh, these evolving, um, the evolving relationship. Uh, so to, to start with uh, the dominant frameworks, uh, as I said, uh, I, I see them as essentially, this is borrowing um, a, 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 uh, from the historian Prasenjit Dwara, the historian of, of China, who's also written a bit about China-India history. Uh, he has talked about sort of this, this binary existing between a civilizational framework and a real politic framework. And we can sort of, uh, uh, sort of differentiate them uh, along a few different axes. Uh, the, the first one, as you can imagine, is a temporal one. The civilizational frame really dominates when we look at pre-20th century history, so 19th century going back millennia, uh, whereas the real politic one is much more centered in the world of nation states, in particular sort of uh, post-World post, uh, War I, League of Nations onward, but really post-World War II when, when China and India become the, the Republic of India and the People's Republic of China become political entities on the global scene. Uh, but beyond the sort of the temporal divide, I think there are interesting sort of um, ways in which uh, we can we can further distinguish um, the two. Uh, th there's a question of, of, of geographic focus also in terms of the ways in which uh, we think about uh, about the two. Uh, geogra geographically, we don't we don't in, in the civilizational framework we don't really take the modern states of India and China as the units. We are we are thinking much more in civilizational terms, so there's an idea of an Indic civilization and a cynic civilization, and the borders of that are actually much more fluid and extend way beyond present-day PRC, present-day uh, Republic of India. Uh, whereas again, in the, in the real political uh, uh, framework, it's very much uh, the nation states in, in, a, in a modern uh, context. Uh, topically also, there are interesting distinctions. Uh, you, you know, in, in the civilizational framework, you really see an interest in uh, cultural history, intellectual history, uh, the movement of Buddhism from South Asia eastwards and to Southeast Asia is a major, uh, major topic of, of, of research. Um, the circulation of individuals, ideas, goods, material objects, these are all sort of uh, major topics of research. Whereas with the realpolitik framework, it really narrows down to state to state relations uh, in, in an international relations framework. So it, it sort of misses out on some of these, uh, these other topics. Uh, there's also an interesting uh, uh, way in which there is a distribution of labor uh, as far as the scholarly world is concerned. You, uh, with the civilizational framework, a lot of this was really anchored in, in first in Europe, uh, and it's, it's still to a large extent is anchored in sort of the sinological and indological traditions that emerged in Europe first. And now uh, there's, a, there's a, a substantial amount of work that goes on in the US also. 
uh, there's less of this in, in uh, there is some of this in China and India, but not as pronounced. Whereas I think with the realpolitik framework, you see the distribution of labor primarily within China and India, with of course uh, a, a large number of political scientists interested in this, in these questions, uh, and in the U.S. and other parts of the world also. So. What's interesting in, in thinking about this framework is, is the fact that each of them comes with significant blind spots. Uh, so in the civilizational uh, sort of framework, uh, what we tend to do is we tend to ignore the messiness of the political history, uh, the, the, the messiness of sort of, I guess, the political history of conflicts that operate at sub-regional levels. And I'll give you a couple of examples of what I mean um, when, 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 I, uh, when I say this. Uh, so take, for example, the, the fact that uh, Southern India was ruled by the Chola Empire about a thousand years ago and expanded all the way into Southeast Asia. Uh, that, that kind of imperial expansion, the kinds of political, cultural, social, economic relationships it generated, uh, we, have, we have trouble with uh, in the civilizational framework because we don't really focus on the politics of this. We are looking much more uh, in the cultural realm. Or uh, another example is uh, the Mongol invasion of the of the Delhi, or the attempted Mongol invasion of the Delhi Sultanate, which was about seven or eight, seven eight hundred years ago. Uh, I say attempted because it failed, uh, and I think the failure itself is a significant moment in the history of South Asia, and it connects South Asia to East Asia in interesting ways because this was after uh, China proper had been conquer conquered and the Yuan Dynasty had been established uh, on the on the remains of the Song. In China, so you have you have again a, a discomfort with trying to adjust uh, uh, these kinds of the messiness of this polit the political history with this in the civilizational frame. And finally, and, and the, the final example that I think speaks much more uh, is much more pertinent to our, our current sort of topic is the late 17th century Tibetan invasion of Ladakh, uh, which um, uh, was more or less successful. The treaty I think was more favorable. My senses was more favorable to the Tibetan side. But interestingly, drew in uh, polities, Mongolian polities, and also the Mughal Empire into the conflict. Uh, so again, you have it's a very different set of agents than than uh, what we would assume uh, to see. And, and the civilizational, I think, approach sort of tends not to be able to focus on on these kinds of things. Uh, similarly, uh, much as there are sort of blind spots in the civilizational mode, there are ones uh, in the realpolitik mode also. And the the focus on in the 20th century, in particular, on um, predominantly on state to state relations. The border becomes the defining, I think, uh, object of study and object of negotiation. Means that we tend not to pay as much attention to the other kinds of connections, interactions, movements of people, goods that are taking place, and in particular the role of um, uh, places that are not neither in India nor in China. So places like Southeast Asia and now increasingly the U.S. that are really points of contact for people of Indian and Chinese origin. Uh, so, so that it comes with with with. Uh, it's, it's been powerful, but it comes with, with blind spots. And, and what, what the, the next thing I'd like to sort of move to is sort of to give you a sense of where I see um, well, at least one of the sort of genealogies for this, or one of the roots for this. Uh, and and it, to some extent, it lies actually in uh, the way in which during the Enlightenment, European narratives, Western European narratives of both China and India were constructed. So you can go back to the canonical works of, of, of Hegel and then through him to others like Marx and Max Weber, uh, who really used China and India, constructed ideal types of China and India, really as a way to, to explain Western exceptionalism, as an attempt to sort of explain that uh, the West is the dynamic part of the world. This is sort of going back to Hegel and his philosophy of history. The West is, is a dynamic part of the world, and, and um, when China and India are sort of these ideal types that stand outside, apart, and, uh, and sort of in many, in many ways are sort of unchanging. Um, What's interesting, I think, in this narrative is two particular features that I think are interesting in this narrative. One is that China and India are really treated as fixed and neatly definable categories. So it, it actually reduces the complexity, the diversity, uh, and you know, one, one might call from a, uh, another perspective the messiness of the past to these ideal types. And they really center on, um, they take you to, to, essentially, you can think of this as taking you to the cores and not really focusing on the peripheries of, of what might be part of as the civilizational spaces of India and China. Um, the other thing, and I think this is really crucial, is that it put them into boxes and they were studied independently. So you had Indology develop, uh, as I suggested earlier, as a, as a focused field of study. You had Sinology develop as a focal field, a focused field of, of study, but there was not as much interaction between the two fields. 
the only place where there was interaction was uh, among scholars who were really interested in the history of Central Asia. So then you, when you start tracking some of these movements, then that's where uh, these two disciplines had to, had to sort of uh, come together. But that, that was, my, my sense is that that kind of scholarship is on the margins of both Indology and, and Sinology. <clears throat> so the reason I, I bring this up is because I think uh, in some ways what has happened in this transition when you have sort of the civilizational to this real politic framework is that we have, we have a lot of the scholarship and, and in the public imagination there has been a slippage where we have taken these civilizational sort of ideas and transposed them onto the modern nation states of China and India. And, and that basically includes uh, what uh, I have often termed uh, inheriting the legacies, and, and Professor Chatterjee Miller has, has looked at the imperial legacies uh, in her book uh, in, in a detailed context. Um, uh, what, what I see as uh, inheriting, uh, uh, you can use more aggressive language, you can say aggressive appropriation of imperial legacy. So on the one hand, you have sort of the, the, the baggage of having been uh, colonized or having been uh, subject to imperial imposition, but there is also the opportunity that, to then take on the imperial borders of your rulers, as it were. So in the Indian case, the British Empire, the borders of the British Empire or the British Raj in India were aggressively adopted by the Republic of India. And the same thing you see in the context of the People's Republic of China. You see it actually earlier with the Republic of China in 1912 itself, and then the PRC does not, does not really change that. But they sort of aggressively appropriated the boundaries of the, the Qing Empire to the extent that they could. So I think this is where this, this framework and, and the transition becomes, becomes interesting and to recognize this, this longer uh, legacy, if you will. So I want to move uh, now to uh, the third point, which, uh, which is to, to sort of look at the present and, and provide a sense of what I see as rather interesting asymmetries and symmetries across China and India. Uh, the, the first one, let's look at symmetries first. Uh, the one that's most obvious is, is economics. China is now in nominal terms uh, five times as large as, as India. If we measure by purchasing power parity, it's three times as large. So there's, there's been basically, a, and this is interesting, most of the symmetries that I'll describe have actually, uh, it's a divergence that has really expanded in the past three or four decades. So if you look at the 1950s, for instance, or even the 1970s, uh, most of the metrics that I'm talking about, uh, China and India are much closer to each other. But so in economics, there's been a massive divergence. Uh, there's also been a divergence in terms of military capacity, whether you look at the size of the armed forces, whether you look at the budget, uh, or whether you look at the kinds of investment that have been made in uh, the more cutting edge areas of science. So in, you know, AI, in, in uh, military science, uh, it, the use of artificial intelligence, for instance, and so on. So there's been a widening gap there. Uh, there's also been a widening gap in basic social indicators. So things like education and health have again diverged tremendously. Um, and then again, perhaps even more relevant to our conversation today, there's, a diver there's been a divergence of global ambitions. And this, in the Chinese case, you see most clearly uh, in, the, uh, in the Belt and Road uh, Initiative of the past few years. Uh, India has nothing comparable either in, in the imagination nor in, in execute, let alone execution. Uh, so there is, there is um, a real difference in ambition right now on the global scale. Uh, and a lot of this then links up in interesting ways to strategic divergences. Uh, and, and I'll just mention a few of them that are quite clear. One is the advantage in geography that China does enjoy. Uh, just this, this is, uh, I guess um, you, you can parse this in a few different ways. It's uh, both are riparian states, but China has rivers uh, upriver, uh, that are upriver as opposed to uh, uh, downriver. So there are, there, there are ways in which that can become strategically important. China also has access to natural resources, I think that are much more extensive than India does. Um, but there's also strategic, in, in strategic, strategic terms an interesting distinction, which is that for India, China remains, has become now the prime adversary. It's not so much Pakistan, but India, uh, for India, China is the prime adversary, which is really not the case for, for the Chinese, where the US really is what most of Chinese uh, strategic thinking really is targeting. So that also creates an imbalance, I think, that can affect um, how we understand what's going on. So you have all these asymmetries, I think, that are in some ways uh, widening. Uh, and in contrast, you have an interesting set of symmetries. I, I you know, I, it's, it's, it's both surprising and to some extent galling to think about the fact that politically, I think the two countries have not been this close since their founding. You know, so, so since 1947, 1949, uh, you have uh, ideas of India and China that were actually quite divergent and they have in practice converged. And by this, I mean, you can point to a few different things. So if you talk, if you look at uh, the sort of growing and, 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 and aggressive ethno-nationalism that you see both in China and in India today, Han nationalism in China, 
Hindu nationalism in India, and its sort of key expression or, or expression through two sort of uh, two examples, I guess you can think of. One is language politics, and we've seen reports about what's been happening in, in Mongolia with language policy there. Uh, but also in India, language is a hugely political issue, and it's being pushed again in interesting ways. And then the other, of course, is, is the treatment of minorities, whether it's uh, uh, Kashmir, Xinjiang, Tibet, Hong Kong. Uh, there's been a, a similar pattern of, of repression uh, and, and, and sort of um, uh, state-led um, ethno-nationalism. Uh, following on uh, or, or linked to that, you see a much wider crackdown on uh, dissent and civil society broadly construed. So whether you're looking at lawyers, at journalists, at intellectuals, at activists, at students, there's been, there's been a widespread crackdown both in China and in India. So it's, it's again brought them much closer to get together in terms of practice. And finally, there's, there's another interesting symmetry uh, that has to do with sort of tech, tech utopias. Both countries have invested a lot symbolically and also in practice in presenting a sort of technologically utopian future. Uh, the best example of this uh, is, is the use of big data and AI uh, to essentially promise the delivery of all kinds of public goods, but in practice also in, uh, you know, increase the capacity of both states and private corporations uh, to, to influence people's lives. So, so it's a... It's a uh, it's, it's a two-edged sword there. Uh, so the reason I, I lay these out, I think, is because I think structurally what this is doing is that it's creating conditions for the possibility of things to go downhill. If the probabilities are higher now for if there's a, a conflagration on the border, when you have a mixture of these, these growing asymmetries and these, these particular symmetries, that it can lead to something that's, uh, that's potentially quite dangerous. Um, so, um, and, and, and what contributes in some extent, to some extent to um, these asymmetries and the and the uh, sort of tinderbox nature of the situation, I think, is the level of mutual ignorance that exists. So this is the fourth point that I, I won't belabor this, uh, but I'm happy to talk about it more um, in the Q and A if it comes up. But you really see this across pretty much every sphere of engagement. So whether you look at the media and the kind of engagement that that exists uh, uh, on the Indian media side in China and the Chinese media side in India, uh, it's it's extremely superficial. And uh, I think. Uh, Anand Krishnan, the, journal, the Indian journalist who, who worked for the Hindu and then later on for, I think, India Today, he, uh, he just published a book um, on, on, his, uh, on his time in China and on his, reflect, his reflections on, on reporting from China. And he makes this point too, I think, where he says the number of uh, Indian journalists in China at any given point in time can be counted uh, on, on one hand. Uh, and uh, and the, the Chinese situation maybe numerically is better, but, but not in terms of content. The same applies for, for scholarship. There is, uh, there is a given, given the importance that each country should accord to the other. The, the, the scholarly engagement remains very, very limited, uh, in particular in China and India. So there's actually more engagement abroad, I feel, at times uh, in seriously studying the two, the, in, in a broad sense, the two together. Um, and finally, you see this also with regard to, to pop culture, the, 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 the level of sort of prejudice that exists uh, in, in, in the two societies vis-a-vis -vis each other. Uh, is um, I think contributes again to to uh, combine with these the rise of ethno nationalism into a potential tinderbox. Uh, so I'll uh, I'll say I'll 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 end with a few reflections on uh, how um, uh, you know what what some of the implications are for the United States um, or or how the U.S. is is perhaps connected to some of this. The most obvious one, of course, and that has been discussed a lot, uh, is is whether in the, this all of this is going to push India into some kind of more formal alliance with the U.S. And this, from an Indian perspective, is extremely, I think, is, is a difficult decision because India has long prided itself on strategic autonomy. Uh, but but this is, uh, I, and I imagine uh, my, my, my fellow co-panelists will, will, will possibly dwell on this. Uh, but uh, but what, I, what I want to focus on actually is a different aspect that I think is becoming and will become increasingly both important and interesting to observe, which really has to do with uh, how the diaspora populations, the people of Indian origin in, in the US and the people of Chinese origin in the US, uh, what role they are going to play. Uh, and I say this for a couple of reasons. One is just the numbers. This, this combined community is now about nearly 10 million large. So it's no longer a small number of people. The second reason why this is significant is because a large, a large I, don't, I don't have the exact figure, I guess, but a large chunk of them uh, have moved to the US in the past few decades. So they're not sort of, they're early, early migrants or early immigrants, in, which, which means that they're actually still closely connected, much more closely connected to um, uh, family and, 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 and their native countries um, than say migrants who, 
who arrived in the late 19th century and early 20th century in the Chinese case, or say the, the big wave that, of Indian migrants that arrived uh, in the 1960s. Uh, and we are seeing in the press uh, interesting instances now of um, how they are using um, both uh, their influence and their success in the US economy uh, to, uh, to sort of connect politics in India, politics in China to US domestic politics, and then how that will filter up to uh, foreign policy making. I think this is something that uh, I think would be very interesting to study and try and understand. Uh, you know, the most obvious uh, way in which we can understand the importance of this, of course, is the fact that the possible future vice president is a member of this community, uh, one, you know, on the Indian side. But I think you can actually trace a whole range of other, um, other um, uh, sort of political, political leaders who, uh, who, are, who, might be, who might be influenced uh, by, by these diasporic activities. Uh, so, so this, I think, uh, is, is something that, that the US may become involved in, uh, in China-India relations in a, in a sort of backdoor way through, through this. It will also, of course, I think, affect the ways in which uh, uh, Chinese and Indian populations are perceived in the U.S. And I mean, in the, in the recent summer, most of the conversation has really been about xenophobia, uh, which is a longstanding problem in, in, in U.S. history. Uh, but, uh, but it'll be interesting to see how that also evolves. Uh, so so I'll, I'll stop there uh, and, and look forward to uh, the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, thanks so much. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Professor Ghosh. Um, uh, we will turn things over to Professor Miller. Do you mind going going next, so 15 or 20 minutes or so? Great, thank you. Uh, so I feel like that was so comprehensive that I don't know, there's almost nothing left to say. That was a fantastic, uh, I think, overview of the relationship from many different angles, historical and, and geopolitical, as well as uh, its implications for today. Um, so, you know, uh, Arunav is an, is an historian and I'm a political scientist. So I'm just going to have a, a, a similar but yet different take on it, which is that I, I kind of want to talk about um, the, the border dispute. And why I want to talk about it is this, because the border dispute is absolutely central, as uh, Arunab just pointed out, to the relationship, right? So on one hand, you have this border dispute, which happened in 1962, the 1962 war, a war which India lost uh, very badly. Um, and the, that issue still dominates the relationship uh, today in 2020. But yet there's also uh, some complication uh, with this, which is that in, in China and in India, there is this pre-1962 views and then the post-1962 views, which suggests this dichotomy, right, of, um, of what we are supposed to think before 1962 and what we are supposed to think after 1962. But in fact, it's just a lot more complicated than that. There are a lot of uh, complex factors that come in uh, and muddy uh, the relationship leading up to 62 and even the deterioration of the relationship after 62, right? So um, I wanna speak to that. And in doing so, I, I want to draw on um, you know, two, uh, uh, two things which I think are really important. Um, you know, one is, uh, you know, not, not, just, not just this history of imperialism with which, you know, Arunav, you've explored, I've explored, the history of colonialism, and it's, it's there in both our books. But also, I, I want to draw on this, uh, this handbook that I recently published with, uh, you know, two fabulous co-editors, uh, Kanti Vajpayee and Selina Ho at the National University of Singapore. Uh, and to just show you what a small circle it is, uh, TV was actually on our advisory board for that handbook as well. Um, but the reason I want to draw on it is because it brings together um, experts from all over the world, practically every continent, uh, and they're drawn from a wide variety of fields, right? So you have people who are hist or academics, historians, political scientists, sociologists, but we also have policy experts and, uh, and uh, journalists uh, who write for us. And so I would like to also bring in some of their insights as we talk about this relationship. So to begin with, um, it's interesting, you know, Arnab, you said that uh, the uh, China, uh, you know, it was Pakistan was the adversary and now it's China. And I would argue that, uh, in fact, you know, when I talk to Indian government officials, they never saw Pakistan as an adversary, right? And so I think what's really encapsulated, uh, uh, you know, um, in that sentiment is something that uh, an Indian ambassador to China once said to me, and this person said, you know, Pakistan's just the enemy. 
China is the adversary. Um, and I thought that was just, in a nutshell, it kind of you know, captured Indian sentiment towards China. And that's because of this border dispute. Now, the border dispute, which occurred in 1962, um, you know, has not been resolved. Not only has it not been resolved, but India and China disagreed not only on the historic borders in the areas that are in dispute, but they actually disagree on the line of actual control itself, right? So there is no map that depicts the line of control. There's, it's never been clarified enough to even depict on a map, right? Um, and this is even different from uh, the line of control uh, with Pakistan, right, which has been depicted in maps. So the LAC, the line of actual control, has, has, there's no agreement on that. And since 1981, uh, there have been negotiations or talks held at different levels um, every single year every single year since 1981 with no productive outcome. Uh, uh, Taylor Fravel, who actually contributes a chapter for our handbook, I think actually goes through and lists how many, right? So he says there have been eight rounds at the vice ministerial level in the 1980s, 15 meetings uh, of a working group between 1989 and 2005, and 21 meetings of special representatives uh, to the National Security Advisors since 2003. And in spite of all of this, here we are today. Right, um, and the clashes that occurred this year, which resulted in casualties uh, on the Indian side and on the Chinese side, I'm not going to guess on the numbers because I think they are highly misleading on both sides. Uh, but they were the first casualties on the border since 1975. So we're clearly at a point where there is a significant deterioration of the relationship. So now, if you talk, uh, you know, to many people in India or China, they'll say, "Well, you know, it's 1962, and prior to this, look at all the links between the." Uh, Chinese nationalist movement and the Indian nationalist movement, and uh, look at the bonhomie that exists between you know Nehru and Mao and and Zhou and Lai, um, and in fact that also is is not as clear cut. Um, you know one of the things that emerges in, in uh, during this time, particularly pre 1939, um, and you know this is something the historian uh, Rudolf Wagner, uh, who who passed away recently, has has written about, is that while India did look to China, even I would argue even today does look to China as this uh, great civilization, despite having a lot of angst towards the Chinese Communist Party, um, you can actually see from Chinese historical records that this was not reciprocated, right? So in the late uh, 19th or uh, even early 20th century, uh, you know, Chinese intellectuals, particularly young uh, intellectuals, uh, decided that, you know, we could be, how would we reform given Western colonization and Western great power dumb? And so we could reform the way Japan did or uh, Russia, Russia did uh, or Germany did, or essentially we could be a failure like Egypt, like Vietnam and like India. Right? So India, in, that, in, in those views, was seen as, as uh, has having failed under British colonialism. And so th this, kind of, um, this kind of sense that there was a superiority of Chinese civilization uh, was, was actually, you know, you could see that in, through writing in newspapers, which eventually foreshadowed the advocacy newspapers that we see today uh, under the CCP government. So this is a background to keep in mind as the relationship deteriorates uh, in the 1950s. So by the late 1950s, the relationship has started deteriorating. Uh, Tibet is, of course, a cause of it. But there's also just a very deep difference in how uh, India and China sees the border. Right. And, uh, you know, in my book, I had uh, I had gone through these uh, negotiation transcripts. Uh, between uh, Zhou Enlai and uh, Nehru. So in 1960, Zhou Enlai and Nehru uh, conduct border, border negotiations. They're the last negotiations on the border before war breaks out. Um, and there's just this deep difference in how they see uh, these borders. So for China, these are borders that are drawn by colonialism, right? So these are colonial borders. Uh, and because of them, China has lost territory. Aksai Chin, which is in the Western sector, is particularly important because it connects uh, Xinjiang and Tibet, both of which are seen as lost territories uh, by the Chinese. Uh, and they're quite baffled. I mean, Zhou Enlai is quite baffled, in fact, in these transcripts that uh, Nehru and India would not reject borders that had been drawn by British colonialism. I mean, here they are, this anti-colonial uh, nationalist country, and why would they not reject this? And what you see from uh, you know, looking at the work of Indian leaders is that it's a little bit different for them, right? So in, in the transcripts, 
India constantly refers to the previous government of India. Now, the previous government of India is the British government of India, but India sees itself as the legitimate successor to those uh, to those borders. And so, for Nehru, uh, when he talks about these borders, what he says is that they're customary, right? So these borders had always been there. They'd, I mean, I think the phrase he used was "existed since millennia." Right? So these were always existed. They were traditional borders that were customary. And essentially, all British colonialism did was formalize those borders. So there's a very distinct difference in how they even uh, see the border, conceive of the border, conceive of sovereignty, uh, and, and you know, what is legitimate uh, in 1962. And then, of course, you have the 1962 war. Uh, you have Nehru's uh, disastrous uh, failed forward policy for which uh, he has uh, never been forgiven by um, you know, many Indian political figures, including the current government. Uh, and uh, what you see is that after 1962, India starts militarizing. It starts pouring money into its military, something it had not done prior to 1962. Uh, it modernizes. It's this big wake up call. Now, this is where, again, it starts getting interesting because on one hand, uh, and you know, Arunab alluded to this, for India, China is the adversary, right? The border is of prime paramount importance. And uh, the 1962 war has changed everything uh, in a way that wars with Pakistan didn't really, right? So you had 1947 war with Pakistan prior to that. You had the 1965 war with uh, Pakistan after the 1962 war. But the 1962 war really fundamentally changed India's mindset uh, on what it needed to do uh, in terms of uh, geopolitical strategic realities. And so uh, China is the adversary, China is always the adversary, and that's where India is focused on. And so, you know, if we jump forward to 1998, when India goes nuclear, uh, the Indian Defense Minister doesn't cite Pakistan, right, for India's nuclear weapons uh, state status. He cites China. He cites China as the reason India goes nuclear. Um, so, but the, the thing is, that's not how China uh, sees, sees the issue at all. So for, for China, the border dispute is very secondary, right? It's a secondary strategic issue. It's not, a, not of primary strategic importance. Um, Arunab, you talked about this. China is really firmly focused on the United States, right? That's where um, its, its uh, strategic priorities are. Uh, that's who its rival is, particularly in the 1980s onwards, uh, particularly in the post-Cold War um, era. But that's where its focus is. So the border dispute is not China's primary strategic concern at all. And it's put on the back burner right, for China uh, in many respects. And this is very true in the uh, post-Cold War world. Now, a couple of things changed. So in 2008, uh, uh, Hu Jintao and uh, Manmohan Singh meet, and they decide that, look, you know, we need to expand other areas besides the border. So let's put the border issue on the back, right? So we're not, the way we're going to deal with it is not talk about it. If we don't talk about it, we don't have to deal with it. Uh, we can focus on other aspects of the relationship. And that's, you know, when you see the India-China relationship developing um, as well. But there is the other part of it, which is that, uh, you know, uh, India is uh, now moving toward the US. And I, I say that very, very carefully, because uh, India is still technically non-aligned. Right. So no government, including the current uh, BJP government, which scorns anything to do with non-alignment, has actually come out and disputed non-alignment. Right. So the, the, there, are very, there are a lot of euphemisms used. So uh, India is a, the United States strategic partner. Uh, they have a friendship. They have strategic cooperation. Um, the word that is never used is allies. And they're not allies. But you certainly have a change in the Indo-US relationship uh, in the post-Cold War world uh, that did not exist uh, in the Cold War world, right? So given that China's strategic focus is on the United States, right, now, now this becomes an issue because with India's moving closer to the US, uh, while the border concern is still not China's primary strategic concern, the very fact that the United States could be wrapped up uh, in, with, in close defense cooperation with India is now an issue that China does care about. So now we have a situation where the, the geopolitics of it has changed again, right? In a way where uh, India is not China's uh, rival, the United States is, but China certainly has more of an eye on India uh, than it uh, did uh, in the past. Uh, and you see now, like if you look at, uh, you know, if you look at 
um, you know, Chinese social media, if you look at Weibo, for example, uh, what you see is really interesting because now you see, uh, you know, the, 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 this pre-1962 um, views that, you know, Rudolf Wagner has talked about this, the sense of superiority or civilizational greatness. You actually see that today in Weibo with respect to the border dispute. Right. So you actually there the the way uh, uh, Chinese Weibo users refer to the border dispute, uh, the way they talk about India, um, you see those hints of uh, where rivalry lies, and it's not with India. At the same time, uh, India has become uh, an annoyance, and India has become uh, a problem for China in a way that it wasn't uh, in the Cold War world. Okay. So. And of course, in India's view, it hasn't changed, right? So China is still the adversary. Um, India is, uh, is, is, has always been worried about China. Now, having said all of this, which sounds really pessimistic, and uh, you know, I guess in some ways it is, uh, I would say that there, is, uh, there are other aspects of the relationship besides conflict. And here I refer to uh, you know, Constantino Xavier's work, who's actually contributed a chapter to our handbook. And Tino talks about uh, these three or four aspects of the relationship. Uh, and conflict being only one of them, right? So the others he talks about are cooperation, which is the, the best part of it, of the relationship as we can imagine. Uh, and somewhere in the middle, there's coexistence, right? So neither conflict nor cooperation, but simple coexistence. So where and how do we see these playing out um, given the border dispute? So in terms of the best outcome, which is uh, cooperation, uh, we can see that in the economic sphere. And so, uh, it, for China, China has been India's largest trading partner since 2008. Yes, there have been hiccups in the relationship. Uh, you know, there hasn't been as much Chinese investment and Indian investment as we would have thought, uh, but it has consistently been India's largest trading partner since 2008. And India is China's largest trading partner in South Asia. Right, so that's an area of uh, cooperation. There's an area, uh, another area of cooperation that uh, people don't think of, but is actually there. And uh, Julie Klinger, uh, at, who also contributed to our handbook, works on it. And she talks about outer space relations, something that doesn't even really enter people's mind. But outer space relations are have always been an area of deep cooperation uh, for India and China. And uh, they have both participated in many agreements uh, for the peaceful and orderly use of outer space, including uh, some sharing of satellite data, uh, including both of them signing a memorandum of understanding to define what space cooperation is, not only for exploration, uh, but also for research and development, right? For um, scientific experiment satellites, for remote sensing satellites, and even communication satellites. Uh, this has been bilateral, but it has also been multilateral. So you have had uh, China and India cooperate through the BRICS uh, in applications of space, te space technologies. So that is also another area of cooperation that exists, even while we have conflict with the border dispute. Um, and then you have an area like the Belt and Road Initiative, right? Which on one hand uh, would, you know, India does not approve of the Belt and Road Initiative. On the other, it's not that India disapproves of every aspect of the Belt and Road Initiative, right? So you have areas again, uh, where you have clear conflicts. So for example, India uh, objects strongly to the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is a flagship project of the Belt and Road Initiative, where China is going to be investing billions into CPEC. Uh, and India objects to this because it traverses parts of Kashmir that are disputed. Um, on the other hand, um, China, which really does want to co-opt India into BRI, um, has gotten India to accept some parts of it, like the uh, Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar economic corridor, which India has somewhat bought into and um, uh, despite some hiccups is still in the agreement. So I, again, I wouldn't call that cooperation, but that's definitely coexistence. Uh, so. You know, just to just to wrap up, uh, yes, 1962 is a defining moment, right? It is there. It, it defines a relationship. The relationship is where it is because of 1962. But yet, if you look at pre-1962 and post-1962, what you see are a lot of complicating factors, right? So in terms of not just beliefs of uh, uh, leaders, in terms of uh, ideology, uh, but also in terms of geostrategic realities and also in avenues uh, of cooperation and coexistence that we might not necessarily expect, uh, given all of the rhetoric around 1962. Uh, the one last thing I would say is that uh, media representations of the border dispute 
can also complicate matters tremendously, right? So even when you uh, might have governments uh, rush to negotiate, as both India and China did, uh, when the uh, when the casualties happened this year, right? So uh, Subramanian so Jayashankar, India's external affairs minister, reached out uh, very rapidly to Wang Yi, uh, uh, China's minister of foreign affairs, and uh, you did have uh, talks begin right away. But on the other hand, there is significant hawkish elements in the Indian media where the perception of China is overwhelmingly negative, um, as well as you know Weibo users, as I said, because Chinese state media is controlled. But you can see some of these views to Weibo, which do constrain the government. They come back and constrain the government. And so that is another aspect as well uh, that muddies the relationship. So even if there is desire for cooperation, even on such a contentious, contentious issue as the border dispute, uh, there are nationalistic elements uh, that can make that very, very difficult. And so I'll just stop here. And thank you for the invitation, by the way. I meant to say that right in the beginning. I was blown away by Arnab's uh, comprehensive talk, but I'm delighted to be here today. Thanks, thanks very much, Professor Miller. And I, I would say um, to, to those listening in, um, that please start posting your, your questions onto the chat feature so we can kind of transition seamlessly after Professor Paul speaks into a, a dynamic sort of question and answer period. So if you have questions, don't, don't hesitate to post them. Uh, don't, you don't need to wait till everybody's finished. There'll be still time for posting after that. Uh, but with that said, um, I will turn things over to Professor Paul. Thank, thanks very much. Just, uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, inviting me to this uh, panel. And um, I'm uh, delighted to speak after the two uh, distinguished colleagues. Uh, partly because they have already covered uh, much of it. <laughs> but um, I do have a few points to add or to elucidate. It comes out of a paper I just wrote uh, for a conference. Uh, I don't know whether uh, Manjari is involved in it, that the Lee Kuan Yew School is organizing on um, uh, theorizing India-China rivalry, probably you're not. But uh, I think it's some sort of special journal issue. My focus was on actually what I don't have said, uh, the realpolitik part, which in particular, the issue of balance of power, balancing the behavior of China and India, uh, India in particular. And um, so this uh, builds upon a previous uh, edited volume that uh, uh, was published by Georgetown University Press on China and the rivalry in the globalization era. And the reasons for this conflict and Manjari has a really excellent chapter on differing conceptions of international and regional order by the two states as one cause of seven or eight causes we identified. Territory is one of them, um, status competition, balance of power competition, um, uh, resources. But there is um, quite a bit of and strategic ideas or, or culture tend to vary. So some interesting historical ideas are also there. Um, but some chapters talked about uh, extensive cooperation, especially in the globalization era, and the so-called rising power era, that was quite a big deal during the um, 1990s until uh, the arrival of Xi Jinping, uh, especially the post-2009, uh, 2008, 2009, economic uh, crisis where there was quite a bit of cooperation. So since 2012 or so, 2014, let me say, since the arrival of Modi too, what you're seeing is two ambitious men uh, representing two of the so-called civilizational states with uh, all the notions of ethnic and nationalistic identities uh, contesting. But my own um, sense is, this is more than territory. This is about status, uh, international status. And uh, I had some work on that too, and I'm currently developing something a little bit bigger on that project on India status conception. There is asymmetry, and both my previous speakers spoke of asymmetry in uh, understanding of each other. There's considerable asymmetry in understanding of uh, uh, the status aspirations as well as status um, achievements ascribed as well as uh, uh, aspired uh, by both sides. 
uh, what do I mean by uh, ascribed and achieved in the sense, uh, as uh, previous speakers mentioned, for a period of time, these were co-equals. Uh, in fact, the economic growth trajectories were almost the same, except China was doing a lot more social development. But that divergence has increased, but in the Indian psyche, they are co-equals, should be considered as co-equals in the status hierarchy. But the discrepancy in economic and other material capabilities have increased China's desire to be treated as a global power similar to the United States or even superseding the United States. Whereas India is uh, concerned, India is concerned, uh, it is still uh, aspiring to be equal to China. And this aspirational uh, differences, uh, the ascription also is partly because of post-1945 uh, UN system, China got the um, Security Council membership, of course, denied initially, but then uh, returned in 1972 or something. And it, India has not gotten the institutional status accommodations that it has been desiring for a long period of time. So the status is um, uh, being changed, uh, needs to be looked into also Chinese policies. The BRI was mentioned. And why India is opposed to BRI is because the BRI, if it su uh, succeeds, will bring back a kind of Chinese dominated uh, uh, international system or, or Asia Pacific system, uh, tributary model, Tiangxia model, or whatever you want to call it. Because the moment you have uh, enormous um, economic dominance of one power, that power will have uh, hegemony, uh, almost like the Americas. Um, and Asia Pacific, uh, the, the, the problem is uh, almost every state now, China is the lead trade partner. But imagine a BRI which creates uh, and several dependencies and a kind of East India Company without probably direct territorial uh, accession. So obviously India's opposition is purely, uh, uh, not purely, it's largely because of this becoming uh, permanently a second ranking power in the status uh, competition. But I want to focus a little bit upon balance of power and it creates a lot of anomalies for balance of power as you know, is the core realist idea or theory behind um, uh, international order. And this relationship shows a lot of uh, anomalies. And that's actually my focus uh, of my paper. And I would argue that um, even after the 1962 defeat, the Indian balancing behavior has been tepid and very uncertain, or, or periodically, yes, immediately after the war, there was a buildup. But what you notice is the Chinese nuclear test did not generate a kind of, uh, generate a lot of debate within India, parliament and Shastri was put under a lot of pressure. But there was a nuclear uh, pursuit of intense uh, pursuit to balance. There was a test in 1974, but India did not develop a nuclear deterrent. It went into a hibernation mode. It was more like uh, showing up to the world we have the capabilities. So it's even 98, um, the test was conducted, but um, Fernandez, uh, defense minister at that time made a statement. It was the primary threat is China, but they pulled out that statement immediately within the next day saying, no, that's not true. <laughs> so, and ever since then, the buildup uh, on the border or even the military sphere have been very, very limited or uh, asymmetrical. And so why is that so? My contention is whereas with the Pakistan, you know, the, the enemy adversary that was mentioned, it has been an intense buildup. There is direct uh, military confrontation several times happened, uh, Kargil in particular. So I, I make this argument that the China-India rivalry was never existential threat. Uh, whereas uh, India-Pakistan rivalry, at least from the Pakistani side, is an existential threat. You need existential threat to gain what you call hard balancing, depending on 
military alliances, formal alignment, uh, and or active military buildup. So you see that on the Pakistani border and India as uh, nuclear weapons, uh, as well as conventional capabilities. Even though India doesn't want that, but uh, because of the active threat that was coming from Pakistan, India had to devote more than half of its forces to that theater. So China, uh, as a result of series of agreements and this bilateral um, negotiations, and the kind of cooperation coexistence we talk about during the glo uh, globalization era or the initial era, the liberalization uh, era to some extent, um, there has been very little in terms of um, focus on uh, massive buildup on India's side in particular. One of the biggest puzzles is the, uh, the border uh, infrastructure was not at all developed on the Indian side for several decades. And now it's changing, uh, obviously a little bit. The Chinese were building as part of the Tibetan expansion to some extent, uh, economic expansion. And uh, some say this may have a colonial reason. The British thought uh, the, the border is not uh, possible or you cannot uh, bring in troops, then that's the defense. I think uh, maybe um, I don't know if you can enlighten us. This impact of this uh, British strategic ideas, uh, imperial ideas are very powerful in this border as far as I see it. Because why India failed to build the infrastructure, what, you know, is partly coming out of the strategic uh, tactics as well as the strategies of the imperial uh, years. So, what is the difference here? Um, the existential library, uh, rivalry is the rival's um, fear of physical survival as well as um, core identity are under challenge. Um, and so this is a kind of a Hobbesian world where uh, survival is, uh, is a big issue. And um, whereas um, there is a different world of Lockean world, a competition, where there is uh, not fear of existential uh, rivalry, but rivalry still exists. So there could be wars, there could be limited incursions, etc. So this remained a managed rivalry to some extent, and despite the active uh, border dispute. And uh, neither was threatening the physical existence or the core identity of a nation state <laughs> built around ethnic, religious, or ideological grounds. That's not the case with the Pakistan-India context, at least the perception was. But this is changing now. This is what, what I'm trying to arrive at, although my paper was written a little ahead of this crisis, current crisis. And um, what is changing is we are getting into that mode of fear of hegemony, like the Pakistanis fear of Indian hegemony and absorbing their identity and in the Indian side is there is fear because if you look at the Muslim, Hindu Muslim notions of conflict, that, that psyche is also a threat to India's existence as a United State uh, or territorial integrity, if you want to call it. Um, so why 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 is that China China did not challenge India after the '62 pullout? It has been following a path of uh, conflict and cooperation. And so there was no fear that China will uh, undercut India in a massive way, as it happened in 62. And uh, even uh, during this period, the first two decades of uh, 2000s, uh, you had a, or less than two decades, you had a period of cooperation, partly because the China, India, all thought rising power pairs. So BRICS was that part of that paradigm. Um, and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, including India, etc. Institutionally, uh, the perception was that these are all rising powers. I mean, international discourse was also like that. But I think Xi Jinping has really decided that is not very good from status point of view, because the BRIC can't, bricks are not really equals, and that China has this great potential. It was useful for international negotiations or discourse, but now 
they have to pull ahead. And this um, really challenges India's identity quest under Modi in particular, which is India wants to be a player and uh, realizes that if you accept everything that China does, so China um, uh, strategy completely, then your national identity will never be realized. And uh, one can understand that um, desire to be a co-equal, although what I, one cannot understand is the active strategy to get there is not there in India's side, especially the economic strategy or the national development strategy, human development, all the things China did to get where it is today. And so there is a discrepancy in the Indian perception. And that's why this idea of civilization comes back as a big uh, foil and a big uh, rescue point uh, for both sides, about Indian side in particular, that material capacity may be not there, but we're going to get there one day anyway. But for now, we still need to be treated as co-equals based on civilizational or other parameters. So what is happening? China left India to some extent to uh, be the um, regional manager for three, four decades. Uh, it was not involved in South Asia. Suddenly, it has arrived as a major economic player, major um, strategic player. And the Indian Ocean. Indian Ocean is India's uh, major theater of uh, fear. The whole notion of string of pearls was there, but it was never developed into anything big. So this BRI, if you look at it as not just an economic project, it has certain strategic uh, angle to it. Uh, if it is militarized, as the East India companies were, then it is definitely a hegemonic project. But China, to its credit, has not yet militarized completely or hasn't gotten the Navy uh, with it, but it is going to get there. Uh, at least the assumption is that. So you have this um, border issue suddenly, because the border issue should not be viewed as a separate uh, something happening because of the, the border issue is partly a result of the strategic reorientations. China wants um, its BRI project to succeed. And in the meantime, India is building infrastructure especially in the Ladakh region. And uh, some connectivity is asymmetrically still. And buying foreign made weapons, um, Indian media uh, sort of hyper uh, talk about this. Oh, it's the most interesting thing is this hypersonic missile that was tested <laughs> the other day. The problem with India, <laughs> I, am a, I am originally from India, the problem is our Indian media is very good in telling testing took place. I have never heard anything about deployment after that. I like to hear how many missiles are deployed. Um, so the five Rafale missile um, <laughs> aircraft come from uh, France. And there's this nationalistic narrative, somehow this will solve the problem. Uh, not really because if you shoot them down, you know, you got uh, very little left. So they're buying weapons, but we still don't know whether they are deployed or deployable or how effective they will be. But I, I don't want to poo poo India's efforts, but India has done well in some sense, especially the infrastructure. I'm really seeing some changes. How long that will, I mean, other sectors of the, the long border, we don't know how far they are going to go. But still it is, uh, uh, something is happening on the border. So India's problem is, India cannot defend China against China if there is a big war. Yes, short term, maybe short term is all that can, we can hope. There is a massive um, troop movement. Um, it may not be repetition of 1962, but it may be, uh, India could lose major portions of uh, the contested border. It doesn't mean it, it won't escalate. So it needs allies, but India is very much worried about losing its uh, strategic autonomy. So what you are witnessing, the Quad, just, just last week there was a meeting of the foreign ministries, 
quad, those who are not familiar with this, this uh, association or meeting of four countries, US, uh, Japan, Australia, and India, uh, more worried about China's rise, but clearly they are uh, divergent how to approach uh, China's rise. It is not a military alliance. It is what I would call a soft balancing coalition. This is something I have written also. Recently, there was a book on the subject. And this coalition has not, it's, it's an it's a informal entente, has not become a military coalition yet. Uh, but that's where it may be heading if China is pushing hard its agenda. So China has been playing with what you call a wedge strategy, um, to some extent using its economic carrots and economic power. And uh, balancing is still remain what you call a limited balancing, hard balancing. Um, a lot of soft balancing uh, was happening and now you are on the verge of uh, probably a, a new round of um, uh, balance of power activity in the region. And um, China is also uh, building up its capabilities on the India border as well as um, uh, for protection of its um, um, uh, the CPEC investment that was referred to before. Now, this Chinese behavior, it to some extent, um, of pushing uh, through this contested border, that is what happened in the summer, uh, several Chinese soldiers um, came and put camps on the contested areas of Eastern Ladakh. And then there was a clash, uh, some 20 Indian soldiers died in a place called Galwan. Uh, we don't know how many Chinese uh, soldiers died. So the rivalry has now become a lot more threatening than it uh, used to be. And it is also a big puzzle in the 2017 Doklam crisis. There was no use of lethal force. Um, there was fish, uh, fish fighting and all that. But here there was some episode of um, use of uh, uh, firearms. So where are we heading? Let me conclude in a, a, a few minutes. I think the rivalry has potential to expand. China does not view India as a co-equal, but India combined with the United States and Japan and all is an existential threat to China and its ambition to become the next superpower. And this ambition is not going to go away as countries, especially if they have a uh, until it is uh, major strategic failures happen and internal changes take place in the country where ambitious leaders uh, rule. So this coalition building will pressure China to needle India wherever it can. And it knows that there are pockets of vulnerabilities for India. For India, there is a problem of what IR scholars talk about entrapment or abandonment in creating this Glenn Snyder's idea, creating a formal alliance with the United States. So people say, why don't you turn this quad into a military alliance? Will the United States come to India's rescues? Like Charles de Gaulle asked about nuclear, uh, whether France should become nuclear power. Will United States come to the rescue of Paris? That means New York will be hit with nuclear weapons. So this question is much more intense for India's case. India probably has no capacity or interest at this point to defend Japan or uh, Taiwan or South, South China Sea uh, if, if there is a clash between the United States and uh, China. But I do think that um, this coalition may happen if China is not careful. Okay, I'm sure this is being watched in Beijing. So I keep saying the ball is on China's court. Stay where you are in terms of your rising power strategy. You are getting there. No need to rush. You're going to be a dominant power. This is exactly what Germany was told when he thought that Germany under the Kaiser made a big mistake by starting these initiatives. So this rising power phenomenon is a big problem in international relations. And um, I think um, what is uh, clearly showing is that 
Um, uh, structure is one way to look at it, international competition, rising power phenomenon, great power rivalry, etc. But agents, that is agency here, have some role to play, um, but I'm not all that confident that uh, what we will see in the next years to come, uh, more alliance building may happen as India has still major economic and uh, military deficiencies. And others contested uh, by China, Japan and Taiwan and United States to some extent, will put a lot of pressure of building some kind of military coalition. And um, it will be a limited coalition for the time being. And it will also pressure China's nationalists to become more assertive. So you're going to see Asia Pacific a theater of uh, contestation, even in no war could get many crises, um, unless of course, um, a willingness on the part of nationalist leaders to, uh, to reduce their ambitions. And I don't think there's anything happening that can reduce their ambitions because this, is, this contestation is also good for their domestic power, leg uh, domestic legitimacy. Both Xi Jinping and Narendra Modi benefit by showing that they're tough people. So there is that domestic angle, which I didn't bring it at all. And we need to look into that aspect too. And that aspect will stay there because both are challenged by uh, different forces. And economically also in India's case, you need this um, external situation, probably it helps the regime legitimacy. So I'll stop there and I'm sure I took more time than I was asked to speak. Thanks.